Theory is History by Jairus Benaji. Uh, this is chapter four, Workers Before Capitalism. There's a fascinating passage in Dio of Prusa's discourses on slavery and freedom where he says, literally thousands of freeborn persons sell themselves to work like slaves by contract, sometimes on the worst possible terms. Dio wrote these discourses during his period of exile under the emperor Domitian towards the end of the first century. Now it might seem natural to construe this passage as a reference to a special form of contract such as indentured labor, but I think this would be a wrong interpretation. Dio, who was strongly influenced by Stoic ideas, was making a different and more basic point or rather two points. First, that wage labor was widespread in the Roman economy, the reference to thousands selling themselves. And second, that wage contracts entailed a form of servitude, that wage labor was a kind of slavery, undermining the distinction between slaves and free persons, which is in fact the central theme of these, dis these discourses. In fact, this idea seems almost to have been commonplace in the second sophistic, that is, the great renaissance of Greek intellectual culture that flourished in the second century. In a tract called On Salaried Posts in Great Houses, which he was later forced to retract, the, satir the satirist Lucian, whose life straddles the main part of the second century, even coined a term for it, Othello, haha, othello dulea, or voluntary slavery. The Roman upper classes looked down on wage laborers precisely for this reason. A famous passage in Cicero's De Officis says again, all those workers who are paid for their labor and not for their skill have servile and demeaning employment, for in their case, the very wage is a contract to servitude. In other words, subordination was the essence of wage labor. Later in the same work of the various possible reasons why people might submit themselves to the command and power of another, Cicero mentions employment for wages, adding, as we often see in this republic of ours. This is the first sense in which the ancients perceived the nature of wage labor in a relatively straightforward or unmystified form. Secondly, Roman law and society worked with their own conceptual equivalent of abstract labor, expressed by the term opera, plural opere. The contract of employment was construed in Roman law as a locatio operarum, that is, a hiring, not sale, of units of labor, designated by the term opere, for which it is impossible to find a satisfying translation. Although opere could just mean workers, as in the description of the emperor Vespasian's grandfather as manseps operarum, a labor contractor, referring in this case to seasonal workers who moved from Umbria to the Sabine country on a regular basis, locatio operarum was not a hiring of workers, but of labor power. Hence, services is about the best translation in English, labor in some quantifiable sense. Waged mine workers signed contracts with the formula Dixit se locas e locavit operas suis. Um, incidentally, the digest makes it clear that slave owners often hired out the services of their slaves. This was paid labor, except that the payment of the worker was appropriated by the master. The distinction between this situation and the hiring out of one's own services was of no relevance legally. All that mattered was that wages were paid. But to complicate matters, we should note that a slave could also hire himself out. It is a remarkable fact that the surviving sources, both textual and documentary, make repeated reference to occupational designations and workers often refer to themselves in contracts, for example, by their occupation. Even less skilled laborers would do this. For example, P. Oxy 3933 or 390, 3933 
is a late 6th century contract with someone who calls himself a goldsmith's helper. The general implication is that, for large numbers of people, the work they did was part of their identity, or at least of the way they identified themselves to others. Even contract workers retained specific occupational identities. In his manual on, on farm management, Cato advises landowners to gather the olives as soon as possible once they are ripe, and not leave them on the ground for long, adding, the gatherers want to have as many windfalls as possible, that there may be more of them to gather, and the pressers want them to lie on the floor for a long time, so that they will soften and be easier to mill. But these workers, gatherers, and pressers were supplied to farm owners by contractors, following agreements that ideally specified the numbers actually required. They were contract labor. Moreover, entire towns might come to be known for the occupational communities that resided in them. Strabo describes Panapolis in Middle, in Middle Egypt as an old settlement of linen workers and stone workers. And in one inscription, a worker describes himself as a stone cutter, one of those from Sien, implying that the best ones came from there. Paid labor was widespread in construction, mining, agriculture, and domestic service, and presumably also in the numerous industrial workshops that manufactured a very wide range of goods for consumption. In a famous paper, Peter Brunt showed that free labor was extensively employed in public works at Rome. The baths of Caracalla, built between 212 and 216, consumed roughly 2.38 million mandates of skilled labor and a further 2.06 million mandates of unskilled labor, according to the painstaking calculations of one scholar. The striking fact here is the predominance of skilled workers. The fact that skilled workers outnumbered the unskilled was entirely due to the quality of Roman public architecture. In periods of strong demand for construction labor, the masons and other skilled workers were in a strong bargaining position and often tempted to abandon jobs halfway. This prompted repeated imperial intervention to regulate a code of discipline for the industry. For example, on April 4, 59, the building workers of Sardis were forced to take an oath agreeing that employers would be indemnified against any willful obstruction of work. Another industrial sector that worked under similar tensions was the Mint. On Aurelian's ascension to power in 271, there was a massive rebellion of the workers of the Mint of Rome. Aurelian is said to have suppressed this with the utmost ferocity, bringing the army in. One source puts the number of dead on both sides, presumably, at 7,000. Although there are conflicting accounts in the sources, they concur in the view that the quality of the coinage was the heart of the issue between the mint employees and the authorities. These tensions survived into the late empire. In 363, during the fierce religious conflicts that erupted in Alexandria, the manager of the mint was lynched by a mob together with the hated Arian Bishop George. In one anonymous tract of the mid fourth century, written to suggest ways of affecting efficiencies in administration, the author wrote, The workers of the mint must be assembled from every quarter and concentrated in a single island so as to improve the utility of the coinage and the circulation of the solidity. Let them in fact be cut off for all time from association with the neighboring land so that freedom of intercourse may not mar the integrity of a public service. It is doubtful if any emperor would ever have taken this kind of prescription seriously. At any rate, the production of the gold coinage was always highly centralized, and one imagines the leading mints as workplaces that concentrated substantial numbers of workers in a shop floor regime that turned out millions of solidity each year. The remarkably high quality of late Roman gold shows how tightly controlled all of this labor in fact was. At the other end of the spectrum from these large imperial projects and government enterprises were the thousands of smaller private enterprises, workshops, farms, and estates, 
where workers had much less leeway in terms of sheer size or physical concentration and had to rely mainly on their individual skills. But here we are fortunate in having substantial documentation in terms of the thousands of papyri that survive mainly from Middle Egypt, the districts south of the Delta. Most published papyri are in Greek and, to a lesser extent, Coptic, but Vienna contains a substantial holding of Arabic papyri from the early Islamic period, which are largely unpublished. It is the it is the papyrological evidence that shows how extensively free labor was used in areas of the Mediterranean, such as Egypt, how widespread wage labor was, and certainly became by late antiquity, and the very diverse forms in which workers were recruited, paid, and controlled. In the surviving wage agreements or arbits for trudge, cash, cash wages are common. And since most of these agreements are from the later period, mainly the 6th and 7th centuries, a period of exceptional prosperity for the Eastern Empire, this means wages in gold coin. But wage formulae varied according to the type of employment and age and gender, and so, of course, did the amount of the wage. In one second century agricultural account, the wage differential between masons and their helpers is 7 to 4. That is, unskilled wages are a little over 50% of skilled wages. The skill differential appears to have been remarkably stable. Diocletian's Price's Edict from over a century later shows an almost identical ratio, 2 to 1, for a wide range of occupations, with the agricultural workers at the bottom of the scale and skilled or highly skilled op occupations receiving twice as much or more. The ceiling prescribed for rural laborers in the Price's Edict was a cash wage of 25 denarii, equivalent to just over one and a half kilograms of wheat a day. In 6th and 7th century contracts, the less skilled groups received two to three solidi a year. Converting these figures to wheat equivalents yields a roughly similar amount, less if the wage was two solidi, more if it was three. In fact, John Chrysostom tells us that self-employed artisans were better fed than wage laborers because, as he says, employers tended to cut a substantial part of the wages of the workers they employed. John lived and preached in Antioch, where there was a substantial middle class by the later 4th century, and it is possible that many employers were drawn from this class. On the other hand, skilled workers had more control over the terms of their agreements and, it seems, strong reference for peace rates. In a second century contract, two stone cutters list a schedule of rates according to the size and type of stone to be cut, and then state, all the aforesaid stone we will cut, but no ornamentation shall be required of us. In harvest contracts from the same period, workers reserve the right to inspect the area assigned to them, since their wages were calculated on a par hectare or per hectare basis. The Sardis building workers, I mentioned earlier, were able to get the authorities to agree that if a craftsman was forced to abandon work due to sickness, the employer would be required to wait three weeks before seeking a replacement. Perhaps the most striking fact about late antique wage agreements is that employees were actually able to introduce a, recip a reciprocal penalty clause in the event that either side terminated the agreement for no good reason. In P. Oxy 3641, a contract between a large estate and a, and a millstone cutter who was being given his job for life, the clause reads, if your excellency through your administrators ejects me without reproach or inefficiency or any cause whatsoever, you too shall be subject to the same penalty. But even more remarkably, the reciprocal penalty found its way into less skilled contracts. The goldsmith's helper could get his employers to agree that if you eject me without any cause, you are to suffer the loss of my whole wage. Even sharecroppers could get landowners to agree to such a clause. In SB 12, 11240, which is called a Mistotique homologia, 
that is a wage agreement, the sharecropper agrees he will pay a fine of 12 solidi if he decides to quit prematurely. But conversely, if you decide to evict me from the job before the expiry of the contract, you will pay me the same amount as a fine. The expansion of wage employment in the late antique period led to a new kind of confidence among workers. Some, indeed many, professional groups like reapers, stonecutters, canal workers, masons, and shipwrights formed mobile, self-regulating groups whose conditions of work and life were the antithesis of the isolated domestic servants recruited on general service contracts who were called para paramonorio. Why? <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this. Para paramonorio. These workers worked in teams and moved around between construction sites, farms, estates, quarries, and so on. Others were part of a wider urban community, hence stable, with sometimes a strong attachment to their local bishop. In his funeral oration for Basil, Bishop of Caesarea, Gregory of Nazianzus, recounts how, on one occasion, when the highest official of the eastern prefecture, a man called Domitius Modestus, was rumored to have summoned Basil and was threatening him, the year was 371, a huge crowd gathered, armed with anything they could find. Gregory says that the nucleus of this fused group was formed by workers in the government-owned arm, arms factories and textile mills or workshops. Above them, he says, in situations like this, it is they who are especially hot-headed and daring in their outspokenness. An interesting gl glimpse into the psychology of the more organized groups of workers. We know little about the internal organization of workers, but it is possible that the Conuretions Clericorum, or unions of priests of the Merovingian period, 6th to 7th century, which the church hierarchy sought to suppress, had their roots in a more widespread tradition of voluntary associations among artisans and workers in the 4th to 6th centuries. The dock hands of Portus formed a cartel or closed shop in the mid-4th century to which government extended public recognition. The craftsmen in the building industry also had associations of their own, and Sozomen reports that the public sector employees of Sisychus were organized into two large guilds. This raises a final issue of whether one can discern the elements of a culture of radicalism among workers. I would like to suggest that the answer tentatively, tentatively is yes, and to cite two rather different examples of this. The first concerns harvest gangs in North Africa in the 4th century. They are only known to us through sources that were unrelentingly hostile to them since they became involved in the religious conflicts of the 4th century. The Catholic sources and at least one imperial constitution refer to them as circumcellions, a name it seems that they rejected, preferring to be called agonistici, agonistici, that is, those who struggle militants. The circumcellions were strongest in Numidia, Algeria today, where the wheat and olive harvests generated a huge demand for seasonal labor, particularly in the 4th century when Africa dominated Mediterranean markets. Augustine, who was very hostile to them, as he was to the Don Donatists, generally, accused them of spreading terror in the countryside. Their gangs certainly included women, since Augustine tells us so repeatedly, because he found it scandalous. What makes the Circumcellions so fascinating is the repeated reference to their radicalism and writers, who were appalled by it. Optetus tells us that when the movement first emerged in the 330s, loan agreements became null and void. No moneylender had the freedom to recover his capital. And when they were traveling, employers were forced out of their vehicles and forced to run like slaves behind their own employees. In short, under their domination and thanks to the ideas they held, the condition of master and slave was reversed. The circumcellions formed the radical wing of the Donatist church, 
and must have drawn much of their inspiration from the way this church projected itself. The constant reference to their leaders should be explained by the internal organization of the harvest in North Africa. According to Marseilles, the Maghreb reapers divide the field into sections line by line and place the most skilled worker on the right. He is the one who starts and directs the work. The reference to this worker as Sultan recalls the description of the Circumcellian gang leaders as Prince Peace. A different kind of radicalism is embodied in my second example, which is from Egypt. In the Fayum, in the late 4th century, a whole network of monasteries sent their, sent their monks out into part-time wage labor, again mostly the harvest, and these monks, part-time workers, then pulled their wages into a fund that was used to feed the poorest families in the district, or dispatched to Alexandria, in the form of food and clothing for people in the jails there, as well as migrants and persons in need. To assess this example properly, we should recall that mo monasticism began among ordinary people as one response to the huge restructuring of state and economy that occurred in the early decades of the 4th century. Pacomius founded the first Cenobitic monastery on the site of a deserted village in Egypt, and as with the Circumcellians, whose leadership was drawn from the Donatist clergy, if Augustine is to be believed, this remarkable enterprise in the Fayum was led by a priest called Serapion. The main conclusion to emerge from all this is that the working class is not a product of capitalism specifically, unless there is a sense in which class itself is peculiar to capitalism, so that workers before capitalism failed to constitute a class in the same sense as workers under capitalism. Marxists have radically underestimated the extent of wage labor in so-called pre-capitalist societies, for reasons I shall come to in a moment. Some of the evidence cited here, I lost my place. Some of the evidence cited here was available to Marx, if he had had the time and inclination to look for it, but most of it was unavailable. Papyri, for example, only began to be discovered in substantial numbers in the 1880s, and it was not till 1950 that anyone put together a published collection of wage contracts from the papyrological material. However, attention to historical detail is only part of the story. The more fundamental reason for simply ignoring the existence of workers before capitalism is the strength of primitivism in the Marxist tradition. Wage labor strikes us as a peculiarly modern institution because the ancient world, indeed all periods of history before capitalism, are seen as intrinsically impervious to any of the institutions that characterize capitalism. Not all socialists subscribed to this view. Whether, like Otto Rule, they were willing to believe that under the dominion of the Roman Empire the economy had developed in Italy almost to the threshold of capitalism, or, like Arthur Rosenberg, once spoke of capitalists and proletarians in the Greek and Roman worlds. Rosenberg was a Roman historian before he became an active communist. Or, like Feliciano Serro today, one speaks of a form of capitalism compatible with the historical conditions of antiquity, there's always been a modernist strand in left-wing thinking, which we desperately need to salvage. Marx's savage footnote on Momsen in chapter 6 of volume 1 is deeply polemical. He attacked Momsen for positing the development of capital in a world that made widespread use of slavery. In Ramesh Geschicht, Momsen characterized the late republic as a regime of aristocrats and bankers, and the republican economy as an agrarian... Um, Mercantile, in, as an agrarian mercantile economy based on masses of capital and on speculation. These views were strongly influenced by his perception of American capitalism in the 1850s, which he described as a government of capitalists in a country based on slavery. True, Mumsen was not Marx and may not have had even a rudimentary grasp of what Marx called the modern meaning of capital, the sort of capitalism that Marx took as the object of his investigation.
but Marx himself was willing to describe the American slaveholders as capitalists. In Volume 3, there is a passing reference to the elder Cato as both a landowner and capitalist, and he and Engels refer in the German ideology to the vineyards and villas of Roman capitalists in the age of Augustus. None of this seems particularly exceptionable today. In any case, the text which generated the footnote in Marx is one of the least well-constructed in capital. After saying in and for itself, the exchange of commodities implies no other relations of dependence than those which result from its own nature, Marx goes on to say, on this assumption, labor power can appear on the market as a commodity only if and insofar as its possessor, the individual whose labor power it is, offers it for sale or sells it as a commodity. In order that its possessor may sell it as a commodity, he must be the free proprietor of his own labor capacity, hence of his person. This is followed by the footnote on Momsen. But if the predominance of free labor is merely an assumption, what sense does it make to drag history into the picture and contest a historical depiction of reality? Moreover, even a statement on this assumption, labor power can appear on the market as a commodity only if, and insofar as, its possessor, the individual whose labor power it is, offers it for sale or sells it as a commodity, fails to be a valid deduction because it ignores slavery. Labor power can appear on the market as a commodity, indeed did, even when free laborers are scarce or non-existent. Apian tells us that a major reason why the rich who had monopolized the public land and carved huge estates out of it preferred the employment of slaves was that the peasantry was subject to conscription and the supply of labor unstable. The point of these remarks is not to deny the centrality of free labor to the accumulation of capital in the modern economy, modern forms of capitalism, but to undermine the particular way Marx attempts to construe the link between 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 wage labor and capital. In chapter six, Marx tends to argue as if the use of free labor is a logical presupposition of capital, when it is clear that individual capitalists exploit labor in a multiplicity of, of forms, and this not just when capital exists as a manufacturer and domestic industry. Marx was aware of this because he wrote, machinery all shall, fuck, Machinery also revolutionizes the contract between the worker and the capitalist. Taking the exchange of commodities as our basis, our first assumption was that the capitalist and the worker confronted each other as free persons, as independent owners of commodities. But now the capitalist buys children and young persons. The worker sells wife and child. He has become a slave dealer. It is fascinating to see Marx referring back to chapter six here over 200 pages later and re-emphasizing the hypothetical nature of the assumption about the free worker. But it was that assumption that prompted his attack on Momsen. More fundamentally, Momsen can be defended in terms of his characterization of the economy of the Roman Republic as based on masses of capital and on speculation. That Marx was the first to expound the nature of capital in a scientific way does not mean that capital in general was a complete mystery to all earlier generations. The idea that a sum of value ceases to be capital unless it is constantly active and self-generating is found in both Basil and Gregory of Nyssa. Ambrose, a member of the late Roman aristocracy, has a vivid passage on the restless nature of capital and tells us that the capitalist has no interest in holding back his money, but only in deploying it actively. This is not the place to explore the background of these ideas, the vast accumulations of money capital that formed the mainstay of the aristocracy. Suffice it to say that by late antiquity, both wage labor and capital, the basic elements of the capitalist mode of production were fully formed, but that their conjunction was much less obvious. It took another five centuries before something like a capitalist system began to emerge in the Mediterranean.